Hey everybody, Jeff here from Outseta. So today I'm going to talk to you about the most successful SaaS company that I've ever been a part of and what I learned at that business. So the company is called Buildium. It was a SaaS product in the uh, property management or, or real estate vertical. And I led the marketing team there for, for five years. I was their first head of marketing and the company went on to be sold for $580 million to a publicly traded company. That is still to this day, absolutely crazy to me. Uh, but I thought I would film a video um, reflecting on some of the most important lessons that I learned through those five years at Buildium. Uh, and specifically, I got to work in the context of a small team that was operating a SaaS business at an extremely high level. And these are the things that sort of rubbed off on me uh, throughout that process. So the first one is, Focus on a market segment until you dominate it. When I was brought in at Buildium, uh, I was sort of tasked with growing the company that much faster, and I had just finished an MBA program. And one of the things they teach you in business school is to think about the core competencies of your company and then apply those um, wherever you can to grow faster. So at Buildium, our core competencies were software development and expertise in the property management industry. And the company initially targeted residential property management companies only in the United States. So when I thought about that, I said we could grow faster by targeting commercial properties. We could move into new geographies. We could translate uh, the software that was only available in English to Spanish. There were all these opportunities to sort of expand our market and grow faster. Uh, but the CEO of the company, his name was Michael. Uh, he basically said, no, Jeff, we're not going to do any of those things. We only want to focus on the residential real estate market in the United States. You basically have free reign to help us grow any way that you want, but keep your eye on the ball in terms of that market. We don't want to expand to commercial properties or other geographies, et cetera. And to this day, I am absolutely convinced that that decision to not expand our focus was one of the things that led to Buildium's success. We had a massive amount of focus on that residential real estate market just in the United States. And by shrinking our focus, I actually think uh, we were able to increase our conversion rates. We were able to build a better product and just having that focus helped us grow that much faster. Related to that, the second point is you don't need a huge total addressable market to build a big company. This is a message you hear a lot from venture capitalists in particular. They want to invest in companies that have a huge target market because there's just that many more buyers and the company has uh, the opportunity to be, to be bigger if they have a bigger market. That is certainly true, but Buildium is an example of a company that had a relatively small target market and still had a big outcome. So our market research said there were about 100,000, 120,000 uh, residential property managers in the United States that represented our target audience. Buildium would go on in, in my tenure to win about 20,000 of those as, as customers. So we had somewhere like 15% market share, and that led to a $580 million outcome. So I think the learning here is you can actually focus on smaller markets and drive a big outcome if those markets aren't incredibly competitive. So I would not rule out a market as a good market uh, unless it was both small and competitive. In that case, I think you're going to have a hard time driving a big outcome. The third lesson is the early team is everything. This one is very non-controversial. I think everybody knows this, but I think it's really important that you do everything you can as an early team to bring the most talented people that you can onto the team. Uh, and it's worth doing things like issuing equity liberally in order to get those folks on the team. Uh, I think a really common mistake is founders try to hold on to every scrap of equity that they possibly can so that they have a larger ownership uh, percentage. But ultimately, if you don't build something of value, that equity is not worth anything. And I think one of the most important things that you can do is get people on the team early on that will help you build something of value. Following up on that, number four is you can design any sort of equity structure that you want. This is something that I wish more people in the tech industry thought about. All of these venture-backed companies essentially do the same thing. They issue stock options with a one-year cliff. 
uh, in a four-year vesting period, which means you sort of earn your equity over four years and you don't actually get any equity until the end of one year. There's nothing wrong with that structure. It works well in lots of instances. Uh, but Buildium was very early to recognize that you can really design any sort of equity structure that you want. The company was structured as an LLC. Um, they issued what were called uh, membership units rather than stock options. Um, and that meant there was no strike price. That meant that they could be issued um, to employees as rewards without any sort of vesting period. Um, it was just a structure that was very unique at the time and very employee friendly and ultimately helped Buildium attract a lot of the talent that drove this type of outcome. The next one is venture capital is a tool and a commitment, not an outcome. So the media obviously um, publicizes companies that raise large round of fundings, large rounds of funding, excuse me. Um, raising a large round of funding is validation to some extent uh, that people believe in what you're, you're building and see potential in it, but it shouldn't be viewed as an outcome. I think too often people think they need venture capital in order to build their companies, but really you want to build your company uh, build a machine that is, you know, spitting out more money than you're putting into it and then use venture capital as an accelerant. And I think too few companies sort of view the idea of raising funding through that lens. Um, but I also, it is a commitment. As soon as you raise money from, from venture capitalists, you do not control uh, your business in the same way. You are sort of committing to swinging for the fences and trying to drive this big financial outcome. Um, that VC firms uh, need in order to deliver capital to, to their investors. Um, so it's just repositioning how we think about venture capital. It isn't uh, some, some outcome. It shouldn't be about validation. It shouldn't be about building your product. It should be an accelerant and you should recognize the commitment that comes with taking any investor's money. The next one is don't discount the value of non-recurring revenue. So people are hopped up on the benefits of recurring revenue. They, they should be, um, you know, recurring revenue means you don't need to sell your product over and over again. You've got subscribers that just recur every month. Um, it drives up the valuation of your company, all those sorts of things. But a hard truth was at Buildium, yes, a large percentage of our revenue was recurring, but a large percentage of our revenue uh, was actually not. It was uh, driven by credit card processing. Um, and every time a tenant paid their rent with a credit card, for example, uh, we would capture from rev some revenue from that transaction. So that was actually uh, sort of pay per use revenue. But interestingly, while it wasn't considered recurring revenue, it was very much recurring. These tenants would pay their rent every month and we would capture um, credit card processing fees when they did that. So although it wasn't viewed as recurring revenue in the same way that our subscription fees were, it was recurring, it was regular, it was large in volume, and it absolutely drove up the value of the company. Aside from driving up the value of the company, if you have money coming into your business, you can invest that money in marketing, you can invest that money in hiring people, it might not be recurring, but it's still money and it still can be used to drive additional value for the business. Next, we have what you do behind closed doors says everything about your character. This is something I've thought about more and more as I got older, as I spent more time in the, the SaaS industry. Um, and something at Buildium that really stuck with me is I saw the two founders of the company, Michael and Dimitri, um, make some decisions behind closed doors when nobody was watching um, that were just really positive things. They gave people money in instances that they didn't need to. Um, you know, they advocated for their employees in instances when other people didn't. Uh, they just did these things behind closed doors when no one was watching that proved that they were really good people. And there's a lot of folks um, in any industry, let alone tech, who when you close that door and give them an opportunity to make a buck, they're gonna make a buck uh, because they think no one's watching. And you don't have many moments of insight when it comes to the people that you work with and sort of what they're doing behind closed doors. Uh, but I think that's something you should always look for. And there's a reason one of Buildium's uh, co-founders, Dimitri is, is now my co-founder uh, at, Out, at Outseta. Um, it has a lot to do with the type of person uh, that he is beyond just the, the skills and experience that uh, he has.
Next uh, was something that I learned firsthand in hiring a lot for the first time in my career, and that's take chances on up and coming talent, but invest in their growth. So I think I see a lot of um, two different paths when it comes to hiring in startups. There are startups that just want to hire the best people possible and pay them tons of money. And if you have the ability to do that, great. And then there's hires where companies will say, we don't have the money. We're going to hire somebody junior and sort of put a butt in the seat uh, because we know we need additional bandwidth. But the mistake made in that instance is they hire a junior person and then they're surprised when the person doesn't blossom into this great employee. What I learned point blank is most companies, uh, unless they have tons of funding or really expensive products or whatnot, need to hire some junior talent but you need to invest in the growth of that talent. So myself specifically, I was brought on and given the reins of the marketing team very early on in my career, but Buildium hired the chief marketing officer from Constant Contact to mentor me. So they gave me this opportunity to, to make mistakes and grow and be in a pretty senior position as a young guy, but I always had somebody that was super experienced that I could go to with questions um, and her mentorship ultimately led to my success in that role in so many ways. Next, we have you can build a big company without a huge sales team. So Buildium grew to $15 million a year in revenue, uh, most of the time having no sales team, but oftentimes just having as few as two sales reps. Today, we talk about this as product-led growth. I think the story here is uh, if you can lean into product-led growth, you probably should. That's not to mean you shouldn't supplement that with a sales team at some point. But what we found at Buildium was product-led growth actually worked great on the customer acquisition front. And years later, when we did um, raise some money and, and did build out a sales team, this sales team actually had a greater impact by selling additional products and services to our existing customer base, rather than focusing on new customer acquisition. Uh, so an interesting insight there, uh, but I think too many companies just run out and say, okay, we've raised funding or we're ready to grow. Let's hire a whole bunch of sales reps. Um, you should at least consider whether that's the best approach before you take on that amount of overhead. The next point is understanding user experience benefits marketers more than technical or analytical skills. So when I showed up at Buildium, honestly, I had no idea what user experience was, but I was very fortunate to work with a guy named Corndon Luxmore, uh, who became the VP of user experience at Buildium. And he gave me a crash course uh, in all things marketing, but all things user experience as well. And what's magical about user experience is an improvement in the user experience when it comes to buying your software, onboarding into your software, or using your software on the day-to-day -day basis benefits all of your marketing channels. It's gonna make your metrics better. It's going to make your revenue better. It's one of the few investments you can make that literally transforms almost all aspects of your business. You'll get less support volume if you have a better user experience. So it's kind of this magical thing uh, that is massively beneficial for marketers to understand. And when I look out into the world, I see so much about people talking about marketers with technical skills or marketers that uh, have data analysis skills. And while those skills are awesome and important, I think the importance of them is actually overblown uh, in most cases today. Unless you're working you know, at a company like Amazon with a massive amount of data, um, there's probably somebody else that's going to do really rigorous data analysis for you. Most of the metrics and whatnot that you need to track as a marketer are fairly simple and easy to understand. And same with technical skills. I think, you know, the really technical work, you're probably going to be bringing in somebody else anyways. I've worked in uh, marketing for 15 years now as a relatively non-technical person uh, and, and feel like having those skills and the importance of having those skills is way overblown compared to the importance of understanding user experience. Next, we have paid advertising has often neglected advantages over other marketing channels. Paid ads get a bad rap today. There's no doubt about it. The cost of advertising on platforms like Facebook and Twitter and LinkedIn and Google ads has certainly uh, risen over the years. Um, and I think a lot of people have turned a, a blind eye on paid advertising as a result. But 
you have to admit that paid advertising has some advantages over other marketing channels. Um, and specifically the ability to optimize your paid advertising to a specific financial outcome. So what do I mean by that? You can immediately start running paid advertising experiments and you know how much money is coming in one end and how much is coming out the other end very, very quickly. And then you can spend your time optimizing that ratio. You just don't have the ability to do that in such a concrete way with channels like content or SEO or affiliates. So when it comes to sort of learning um, what messaging, what, what user experience, uh, what keywords, et cetera, um, are really valuable to your business, paid advertising gives you a huge advantage in terms of speed of learning. And I think it's important, yes, you can burn a ton of money uh, with paid advertising. So you only should dive into paid advertising once you have some money to burn. But I really am of the belief that if you commit to uh, optimizing your campaigns over a long period of time with a budget that you're comfortable burning, you will be able to optimize those channels and build a very effective customer acquisition channel with paid advertising in the context of almost any business. At Buildium specifically, uh, we started out with um, about $2,000 a month in spending, and we were able to scale that up to over $140,000 a month in paid advertising spending very cost effectively. Um, I didn't think that initially at the sort of outset of, of running paid ads, uh, but I think there's just advantages there that people are too quick to neglect today. Next, I've got the grass isn't always greener. So after five years, I made the decision to leave Buildium to go work at another SaaS company. And part of that was I had started my career at Buildium. I'd been there for five years and I felt like I needed to diversify my experience. Part of it was I was offered my first VP level role at another company. And part of it was the compensation package at that new company. I got almost double the salary um, in my new role that I had at Buildium. And as a young guy with college loans and whatnot, that was really compelling to me. Uh, but I would say that in retrospect, and now having worked at other companies, I didn't recognize at that age how special of a place Buildium was. I recognized it from a cultural perspective and from the perspective of how much I loved my job, but I didn't recognize it from the perspective of how rare it is to find yourself not only in a company that you enjoy working at that much, but also in a company growing at the rate that, that Buildium was. And if you sort of extrapolate out like what would have happened to me from a financial perspective, if I had stayed at Buildium, the outcome probably would have been greater. Uh, and it probably would have done more for my career, even than the doubled salary and the VP uh, title that I got by, by moving on. So I think the lesson here is just to um, sort of always recognize if you find yourself in a great situation that you are in a great situation um, and that the grass isn't always always greener on the other side. Uh, and then finally, we have uh, perhaps the most important lesson in my book, and that's the idea that organizational health is more important than any other business strategy. So we can talk about every marketing hack under the sun. We can talk about um, different means of building product. We can talk about different ways of choosing your, your market and startup idea. But the point here um, is really perpetrated uh, by an author named Patrick Lencioni. Uh, he's got a book called The Advantage that I would recommend. But it basically says, if your organization is healthy, if you can uh, work with people in a team that's high functioning and highly aligned and where people can uh, you know, have respectful disagreement with each other, but still make decisions and execute, that's far more important than any other business strategy. That will take you further than any other business strategy. And I really think that that's true because in an organization that is truly healthy, if things aren't going right, you're going to find your way through them. You're going to find creative solutions. You're going to be able to, to pivot and, and work through the issues that you encounter. Whereas if you're in a business that is growing really well, but you've got sort of a toxic culture or a team, um, you're going to find that often cases you become your own worst enemy. And even though you have all these things working for you, um, sort of the unhealthiness of the organization is what is ultimately going to hold you back. So those were a few of the things uh, that I learned at my time at Buildium over those five years. I learned more about SaaS than any other five years in my career since. 
I hope there's some nuggets in here that are helpful to you as, as you consider your own business.